Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jackie Jacob. I'm the coordinator for the Small and Backyard Flocks Community of Practice on eExtension that puts on these webinars once a month. Um, and this month we are going to be talking about essential oils. What are they and why would you use them? Our speaker today is Dr. Anoop Joni, Johnny from the University of Minnesota. He's an assistant professor there specializing in poultry and is involved in a lot of research with uh, essential oils. All your, oh, if you, have, yeah, if you have a question, put it in the chat box or the Q&A, though Q&A is preferred. Um, and I will, I will be monitoring the questions and uh, making sure that Anoop uh, deals with everyone that we get asked. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It's all yours, Anoop. Hey, thanks, Jackie. Thanks, Mark. Um, thanks, Jackie, for inviting me uh, as a guest speaker on this topic and Mark for making this process much more easier um, in terms of technicalities involved in the process. Can you hear me? Yep, yep, sound okay. great. Is that clear? Okay. All right. So um, as, as, as Jackie was pointing out, I'm a faculty here at the Department of Animal Science at the University of Minnesota. Um, I am a veterinarian by training, and I have a master's in animal nutrition and a PhD in food safety. And after that, I did my postdoc for a couple of years, um, again, on poultry microbiology area. Um, at the Minnesota University of Minnesota, I have a 50% appointment for research and teaching. So it's 100%, 50 plus 50. Um, my research is to look into investigating or, or investigating alternatives to antibiotics to control foodborne pathogens in poultry. Um, and I've been working on the essential oils and their activities. Um, um, and, and we have been researching with um, a national group um, since I started as a doctoral student at the University of Connecticut. Um, so I started in 2006, and this is 2016. Now it's almost 10 years. It's been a wonderful journey. There have been several questions about essential oils throughout the research and people with whom I, with whom I interact. And we, uh, we, yes, yesterday we had a seminar in which a student presented on the essential oils, and then we had a lot of questions from the students um, and we are trying to balance our research with how this information can be, this information can be um, communicated with the people for the translation purpose. Now, I teach an online course on backyard chickens, by the way, and that makes uh, this particular talk a little bit more interesting. But um, I prepared the whole slides uh, from a technical perspective, but I will try to make sure that my talk is a bit... Um, convenient for you folks to understand it much more clearly. I will try to make sure, um, I will put in every effort to make it uh, clearer to you folks. Um, so I teach that online course on backyard chickens, uh, you know, every year since its launch three years ago, we had more than 150 students taking that course and they like that course and then we are keeping on moving with that course even this semester. And I also teach a business planning course and the students in Minnesota, they. Um, they come from different areas, um, and except for poultry, we have a huge group of um, students taking that course in a microbiology laboratory um, that I teach every spring. Now, next slide, Mark. Now, that's a long introduction, but at the same time, I would like you to understand that we are living in a post-AGP world. Now, when we talk about AGPs, we know the term antibiotic growth promoters. And that particular word has given a lot of confusions and complexities all around the world um, because um, the question is who contributes to what? The question of antibiotic resistance is a huge problem that we are currently facing at several uh, books of life, especially from the government agencies, um, from inter international you know, borders, um, food safety perspectives. We deal with that question a lot. Um, how does this happen? And how does the transmission and proliferation of uh, resistant bacteria happen in the food chain? Those are wonderful and beautiful million dollar questions. Um, now, one 
thing we have to be keeping in mind is that ever since the ban of an antibiotics in the European by the European Union in 2006, if I remember it correctly, um, on all the AGPs, antibiotics for uh, antibiotic, uh, for the growth promotion promotional purposes, uh, we've been in the in the United States. We've been constantly monitoring the situation, um, especially from the FDA's uh, perspective. And now the recent change has been long waited uh, that we have the um, the veterinary feed directive, uh, a final rule on that, which is important uh, from the agency's part um, to ensure that the judicious use of medically important antimicrobials are um, are done in food producing animals. So we have to think from that perspective. I'm coming from that perspective. How can this phytogenics or phytobiotics um, can be used, you know, among the so-called alternatives that we have. Um, and are they, are they good? Are they beneficial when we compare those with the, um, with the antibiotics? And what are required? What are, the, what are the research areas that are required? What, are the, um, what is the information that the, uh, the, the backyard flock owners, for that matter, those people who use the essential oils even these days um, need to know about them? So I will be focusing on all these perspectives, and I am um, very much positive about this area, this class of uh, uh, alternatives called the phytobiotics. Next slide, please. Now, I would like to bring the whole co question of uh, uh, what are essential oils and why we have to use them in poultry from, from my own uh, perspective, but from my own story. When I started as a uh, graduate student, um, at the University of Connecticut, working with the essential oils. Um, as a serendipitous um, incident, what happened was that I was teaching a, um, a course, a laboratory course of my advisor, and the students were uh, participating in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a class, in a course, in, in a class where they were supposed to um, add some of the um, compounds to kill, to inactivate bacterial pathogens. So what we did was we gave transcendamaldehyde, eugenol, pimol, and carbacol for the students um, to add to the, uh, to the nutrient broth and test it against the pathogens. And interestingly, um, the next day when I went over to the incubator room and looked onto the plates, everything was killed. All bacteria was killed. And although the concentrations were not properly assigned at that time, it was a, it was an ins it was a time when we, when we thought about you know, putting our, putting our stress on this area of uh, alternatives. Now that was, can you move to the next slide, please? So that eventually led to the publication. You can see that publication right here. It has more than 60 citations ever since its publication in 2010. Um, we tried to investigate the antibacterial effect of transcendamaldehyde, eugenol, carvacol, thymol, um, on Salmonella enteritis and Campylobacter jejuni um, in chicken sequel condoms. Although it, it was actually an in vitro data, which means um, a data that was um, generated based on the laboratory trials, not the field trials. Um, that actually gave us a lot of impetus to move along with the actual chicken studies, which led to the next um, ex experiment. Can you move ne to the next slide, Mark? that eventually culminated in testing transcendamaldehyde and eugenol in 20-day broiler chickens. And again, the effect was that um, the, the both compounds, transcendamaldehyde and eugenol, both phytogenics, both phyto, uh, phytobiotics, um, reduce salmonella colonization in chicks. And that took us to the next step. Can you move, the, move to the next slide, please? That took us to the next step uh, to test the same molecules, transcendamaldehyde and eugenol, um, to use it as a therapeutic, uh, you know, in therapeutic approach, uh, meaning uh, initially for the, for the broiler chick work, we used it for continuously for 21 days. But now in this experiment, we used it for only five days right before they are going for processing. So very little day, I mean, very little, time, very little time for action, just five days. And we found that although the magnitude of activity was uh, reduced, we still had salmonella and uh, Campylobacter killed or inactivated to more than, I would say, about 100 cells per gram 
of the SQL contents, which eventually took us to the next step for you change that slide to. That went on to our you know, investigation whether these essential oil trans in the maldehyde uh, would be able to reduce the transfer of salmonella through eggs, which we, um, you know, non-technically, I mean, technically call egg bond transmission. So in this egg bond transmission, what should happen is that the, after the ingestion of uh, the pathogens by the layer chickens, it should go traverse through the blood or for that matter, lymphatics or whatsoever, and reach the ovarian um, cells, ovarian sites, or, or you know, to the, 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 uh, the ovarian follicles when the eggs are being formed, and then it should end up in eggs. And then so what we did was we collected eggs from all these layers and then we analyzed them for salmonella. And interestingly, we found a significant reduction in the transfer of pathogen, transfer of salmonella through eggs um, by supplementing transinomaldehyde through feed. That was an eye opener. So with these four um, studies focusing right on salmonella with cinnamaldehyde and eugenol, we were, we were kind of uh, strong and stressful uh, there was an indication that these molecules were really effective, although at high, although at, uh, or they, they little high concentration. Now move to the next slide, please. That eventually led us to publish the recent publication in 2017, uh, where we looked into what is behind the activity of cinnamaldehyde and eugenol. Yes, we know that these molecules are reducing Salmonella and Campylobacter. But what is behind this? What is causing the, the reduction? So we found that about, uh, if, I, if I number it right, about 200 to 300 genes uh, were critically downregulated, meaning uh, expressed below the, the normal uh, controls in the treatment groups where we applied cinnamaldehyde and eugenol, which was, um, again, which was a very interesting story um, that, we could, uh, that we could tell our students, to the flock owners, people who want some basic um, knowledge about what is actually behind this. And this is one perspective. I'm going to talk about um, you know, several other perspectives. I just wanted to make sure that this is actually my own testimony. You know, this is a testimony that, uh, you know, that a person started off, um, uh, you know, 10 years ago. And then we, here we are in terms of the mechanistic aspects uh, when it comes to controlling the foodborne pathogens. Now, move to the next slide, please. Now, how does it translate in our efforts to bring together national specialists in this area? Uh, you know, any research, you know, when we, when we, when we do the research um, to make sure that a particular area is good enough to proceed, we have to bring the national leaders together um, in, a, in the form of grants and then try to do the research together. Now what we did was we collectively formed a team, a national team, with uh, researchers, uh, you know, teachers and uh, uh, extension specialists, and Jackie is one of, uh, one of us, and we formed that team and then um, we started investigating uh, the, the efficacy of these molecules in organic site. And now go to the next slide, please. And now what happened was that we could procure two big grants. One was on the pre-harvest side, as you see on the top, um, the pre-harvest uh, USDA NIFA ORE funding uh, we got in 2011. And the post-harvest we just got, we just got awarded with the post-harvest USDA ORE grant in 2017, which is actually a representation of how the federal uh, people and the, and the people who are on the review board, you know, you can assume uh, the people on the organic board is going to be from different walks of life, you know, including people who just know something about, uh, you know, organic chickens, and some of them would, would have really good information about them. Some of them would be farmers, some of them would be producers, some of them would be, uh, you know, researchers, educationists, teachers. They all are in that, you know, uh, in, in the, the panel uh, who selected this is one of the fundable grants for us, our team, our national team, the names are listed on the left of the slide. Um, it is a promising even for us that even, even, the, even the, the, the research on essential oils are being um, recognized at the national level in terms of research and extension activities. Can you move to the next slide, please? Now, where are we taking this? So I was talking to you about my testimonies and research. 
then my testimony in terms of getting procuring funds from uh, the federal agencies uh, for testing their efficacy in essential oil, of essential oils in 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 birds live birds and also in the processed products um, like uh, meat and also in in the products in the meats and the in in and the eggs and then where are we taking this whole research to if it is not getting translated at the industry level or at the producer level, you know, whatever we do in the form of research is not worth it. That would be my stand. Now you can see, can you move to the next slide? So research is getting translated to the industry levels. Now we have products available um, which are being investigated at the industry level by big players in the market like Cargo. Move to the next slide, please. Danisco, you know, DuPont has their own essential oils for poultry and eggs. Move, uh, move again to the next slide. Now, there are recent, you know, the companies which, uh, you know, I had, you know, Jeffo and Callsec. You know, the reason I brought them up also because Jeffo invited me for a lecture at their Canadian conference a few years ago. And that was such a family environment. And then that was an, it was an excellent environment for me to present the entire data to the people belonging to different, you know, box of their research and industry. And that's such a promising environment to see that people are looking forward for essential oils as alternatives uh, to be added in the, uh, in the feed. And for that matter, I'm currently working out with Callsec too. And they are also looking forward for the antioxidant properties of essential oils along with the microbial uh, you know, stimulation and things like that. Move along, please. Now, we, are tra we have transformed from the research um, brands, for that matter, money, and then the translation phase of, the re uh, of, of essential oils. Now, the question is, what are these molecules? Are these magic bullets? And then that's the typical term that my, my, my advisor used to ask me, Anoop, this is not going to be a magic bullet. You have to literally understand this. So what are these essential oils? What are they? Move to the next slide, please. And this is what actually bringing us to um, uh, perspective. And I would like to make it as simple as possible. Now, I, would you please assume that we are talking uh, everything under a big umbrella called as the phytobiotics or the so-called plant-derived compounds. That's the big umbrella that we are talking about. That's the big picture under which we are going to involve all these, you know, all these molecules. Among the phytobiotics, the phytobiotics, the word was coined by Vindish and Kreuzmayer in, uh, in uh, 2007 for the first time um, that they, they coined the term to indicate the, the components in the plant or plant extract for that matter that would have beneficial effects on the performance of animals. That's, what, that's how they coined the term phytobiotics. And I literally like that compound because we are looking for alternatives to antibiotics. So why can't we use phytobiotics, which is actually coming from plants? And now among this, you know, under the big umbrella, we have four different classes. One is the herbs, as you see the red line and botanicals, which you see the brown line, essential oils, otherwise commonly called as volatile oils, you see as green, and oleoresins, which is, uh, you know, written in black. You see, herbs, <clears throat> it's a very common term. We have to understand there are obvious differences between these four different classes of phytobiotics. Now, herbs are traditionally used in medicines. You know, traditional medicines, anecdotal evidence suggests that the herbs can be brought in to cure several disease conditions in humans and in animals. So that is what is known as herbs, which are, which are from flowering non-woody plants. Now, when we talk about botanicals, they are the entire or processed parts of the plants. Now, the best example would be Ayurveda, which is actually the traditional medicine in India. You know, um, we have that botanical section where uh, we use the entire portion or some part of the plant, uh, plant part to, to, to get the concoction or for that matter, the syrup to be used as a curative for treating certain disease conditions. And now coming to the third and most important and our discussion topic is essential oils. You know, there's a discussion as to what needs to be called. Are they volatile oils or essential oils? I would say they, are, they, are, they need to be called essential oils, although they are volatile in nature. Um, so that's the biggest challenge that we obviously face. Essential oils are volatile in nature. And they are the hydrodistillate extracts of volatile compounds. 
Now, what's the difference between uh, essential oils and oleoresins? Oleoresins are semi-solid extracts, which are which are which are which are made in non-aqueous solvents. We have to understand that you know in the process of manufacturing them, producing them, the non-aqueous solvents are literally taken off from the from the from the menstruum, and you you get some semi-solid extracts which are mixed with essential oils, and that is what is known as the oleoresin. So the combination of resins plus oils bring about the term oleoresins. But in essential oils, they are hydrodistilled extracts. They have, uh, they are just the volatile compounds. Now, I, I assume that you got the big umbrella of phytobiotics and the four, you know, smaller classes that are coming underneath. Now, let's go get to the next slide, please. Now, let's go about, let's go a little in depth about what they are. You need to know, and I need to know. I'm so, I'm, I'm so, so forced to read this uh, because you, because. A researcher in me is 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 prompting me to talk to you about the about the actual compound in essential oils. Now, as I said, essential oils are aromatic, oily extracts. Now, what is representing? What is causing the essential oil to be um, oily and aromatic? You see that the second line there, isopentanol pyrophosphate units. Those are the building blocks of essential oils. Now, they have both isopentanol. And this two, you see the two, uh, you know, pyrophosphate unit attached to it. So that becomes one unit, uh, which will be further polymerized to form several compounds. And now you have to understand that we already have characterized about 4,000 to 5,000 such compounds. So those are all isopentanol pyrophosphate polymerized units. Now this particular, if, if I tell you that as a, as a big, a group of about 5,000 compounds, that would not help us either. So we have to bring it down again to four different classes. You see the different classes, just like the antibiotic has different classes in them. We have four different classes, major classes that we have to discuss. The first thing is the terpenes. Now, uh, <clears throat> give me a second. When we talk about terpenes, th those are the major, um, um, you know, chemically more important. We have uh, you know, hemiterpenes, monoterpenes, sesquiterpenes, diterpenes, triterpenes, and go, you know, ter tetraterpenes in them. You know, one of the examples that you can get would be uh, for hemiterpenes would be isobaleric acid, which is also an essential oil. Um, when we talk about the example of monoterpenes, the example would be geraniol. I, I don't know if you have heard about terpeniol, um, about limonenes, about linalools. Those are all coming under the monoterpenes. Um, just like we call penicillins and cephalosporins, I mean, penicillins and fluoroquinolones, we also have classes in the essential oil category. Now, coming to terpenoids, the second one's there. They are, they're, they're pretty much terpenes, but they have an oxygen in their structure. Now, what oxygen makes is that oxygen always donates electrons, that's what I understand. And these electrons are so, so much active you know, that's one of the uh, reasons why they are really active against the, uh, the, the foodborne pathogens, for that matter, bacterial organisms. So when we talk about terpenoids, they contribute to about 60% of the total essential, I mean, total natural products. So they are really important, uh, you know, classes of essential oils. Now coming to phenyl, phenylpropenes, when we come to that, you see the structure which is having a phenyl compound in it. That's a phenol compound in it. The most important example is eugenol and transcendamaldehyde. You know, those are the compounds with which I work with. Now, you have to understand that terpenoids and phenylpropenes, the second and third classes, those are aromatic in nature. And now, they are called aromatic compounds. Now, under the aromatic compounds, we have, again, different classes. That's what, you know, when we go deeper into deep, you know, in, in deeper and deeper, we realize that there's a heavy potential for the you know, essential oil area to be an alternative. It is not just one organism. They are distributed in nature in different classes. And within the classes, they have subclasses. And I'm going to give you just some examples. And uh, these, if you are overwhelmed with the information on the classes, I you know, ask forgiveness for this. But this is really important. Under the category of aromatic compounds, you see phenols. You see phenolic acids. You see quinones. You see flavones, flavonoids, flavanols. You see tannins. You see cumarins. And there are different classes subclasses that are coming under the so-called 
you know, category of essential oils. This makes it more important because the research has not gone in depth enough to determine the possibility of these, um, you know, uh, this, this, this myriad of um, essential oil constituents that we, that we have to little, that, that we have very little idea on. So now move to the next slide, please. Now, what are the major mechanisms of action by which the essential oils act to make um, the performance in, uh, to get the performance in chickens? Um, they are divided into five different uh, categories. One is antimicrobial. Everybody knows it. They are effective against viruses, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and parasites. And uh, they're antioxidants. The antioxidant property is coming, is, is there because of the double bonds that are present in their structure. And as I said, you know, when, when it comes to double bonds, they're so, they're powerful in terms of, um, you know, bringing about the, the uh, you know, improving the stability of the products and, uh, and improving the, um, you know, the, the uh, reducing the lipid oxidation, um, you know, the antioxidant properties would be beneficial in terms of the, um, in, in terms of improving the stability of the products. Now coming to the third, which is anti-inflammatory, I will, I will discuss that a bit, um, you know, in the, in the coming slides. And then the fourth term is digestive conditioning. You know, that's a, that's a relatively new term that we are bringing up in terms of human medicine, we are looking into the enzymes, how the, how the diets are actually causing a conditioning in the, in the, in the stomach, uh, in the large and small intestines. I will talk about that uh, in a few minutes. And finally, the fifth property, the major property that the essential oils possess is a microbial balance. Although we need more research on the topic, I will give you some idea as to what uh, we mean by the microbial balance research so far with essential oils. Move to the next slide, please. Now, everything, all these five factors together should work well to get the performance in poultry. Now, I'm going to talk about those five things um, later on, but now our primary focus is poultry performance. And that's the end point of what we are looking for as poultry producers, as people who raise backyard chickens as small flocks. And, you know, we are looking for the performance. We need good quality meat. We need good quality eggs. What can be done in order to prove, in order to make sure that we have good quality meat and eggs from our chickens? Now, first and foremost example, you know, I've quoted two major papers in this, major publications, um, which indicated that the feed conversion ratio which means how much feed um, do they need to uh, make how much part, uh, how, how, how much uh, you know, body weight, how much of the feed is required to translate into good body weight. Uh, that's called as, that's the easiest way to understand the feed conversion ratio. So the feed, feed conversion ratio can be, can be, can be improved by 4.2 percentage by um, capsaicin and cinnamaldehyde and caracol. You see that the third line right there. And they all, and that was, and these chickens, these barley chickens were on the maize diet. And there's, when they were on beet barley diet, they got the FCR, you know, the improvement in the FCR by two percentage. Are these factors a huge increase? I would say, you know, with a couple of publications coming from, um, from different, two different angles, I wouldn't say that is enough to say that the performance is improved. But what it indicates to me is that Two independent research groups are, are looking into the products which are almost same, which are capsaicins, cinnamaldehyde, and carbacol, you know, functionally effective in improving the feed conversion rate. And it could be because, you know, they reduce feed consumption uh, because of the, um, you know, the, their effects on the satiety center in the brain. So we don't want to go into the physiological aspects now. I just would like you to focus on the performance data was improved. Uh, in terms of broilers. Move to the next slide, please. And what happens in layers and in terms of the eggs? These are all controlled experiments. So we can use or extrapolate this, uh, these results into backyard chickens. If you are literally focusing on improving the quality of your eggs and meat, yes, there is no harm in trying this because these, are, these, these have definite you know, chemical uh, backup. They are not just voodoo uh, signs. They they have, you know, 
chemical structures which have got which have got the the so-called oxygen molecule or for that matter double bonds those are the critical elements in causing the antioxidant properties and the antibacterial properties um, against the bacterial pathogens and to improve the lipid oxidation of meat so in layers you see that one of the studies that indicated that was from Kabuk, if I remember it right um, said that um, the addition of essential oils resulted in reduced omega-6 to omega-3 ratio in egg yolk, and it also improved eggshell strength, omega-3 fatty acid concentration, and it improved egg production, and also the feed conversion ratio under the hot conditions where the birds are under stress. And that is one critical point that we can uh, employ in the backyard, backyard situations, if the backyard, if the flock is outside, and if you are worried about the stress situations, I, you know, this particular research would highlight that the, the, the essential oils could be an alternative, um, um, could be an alternative and help the birds under stress situations if, if, if they are provided with ambient concentrations of essential oils. And in terms of broiler breeders and quails, they found um, some of the findings indicated the, the, the essential oils improved fertility, hatchability, chick numbers, chick weight, etc. Now, I, you know, when I, when I said, when we talk about poultry production, these are all, as I said before, these are all controlled experiments. And these experiments uh, have their own, um, you know, limitations and their own um, issues when we go through those publications. But at the same time, what it leads us um, to think about is the potential of the essential oils, um, you know, in terms of improving the FCR and in improving the performance, the overall performance in terms of producing meat and eggs in broilers and layers, respectively. Move to the next slide, please. Now let's talk about some of the key features of how these essential oils could result in performance. So these points could be considered for your backyard chicken raising and for that pasture, pasture chickens. You can, you can employ the same principles um, to understand what the essential oils are doing in terms of your flock outside of that matter if you're raising it in the backyard. The first and foremost is the digestive conditioning. Now, digestive conditioning uh, has two important points. One is that it stimulates the digestive enzymes, that I've listed those, the, the digestive enzymes right there, and those are all critical enzymes which are required for breaking the food or feed into its constituent components, which would make them easy for absorption. And number two is that it improves nutrient digestibility, the second point that you see there. Um, it is, it is established that, um, you know, when I looked into this, uh, a couple of uh, publications, I found that, um, <clears throat> sorry, I found that um, the, the essential oils um, improve the ileal digestibility of amino acids and uh, um, amino acids especially. So um, that mean and also the fat, protein, amino acid, and phosphorus and calcium digestibility got improved with essential oil treatment. And if you really need to know which essential oil actually resulted in that, you know, those, comp those, those research publications that I've listed there, they are specifically, uh, they specifically talk about which digestive enzyme is, is actually stimulated, which, act which nutrient digestibility is act has been actually increased as a result of the essential oil treatment that is already there. And because of the, um, you know, because I wanted to reduce the content in the slide, I did not put the specific names of essential oils right there in place. But keep in, keep in mind that digestive conditioning is very much required for any flock for that matter. It doesn't matter it is a commercial flock. It could be backyard flock. It could be um, pasture flock. It could be organic flock. You know, any flock, we need the nutrient digestibility or, and the absorption of the nutrients to be key um, in terms of improving um, the status of essential oils to the growth promotional purposes. And I'm not, I'm not saying that they are currently being considered uh, and, and then currently we have sufficient evidence to prove that they are, they, are, they, are, they are growth promoters. But there are indications that they could be potentially um, used as um, you know, uh, alternatives to antibiotics in terms of promoting um, the growth in terms of improved FCR 
and improved digestibility, improved mineral retention, improved mineral absorption and things like that. Move to the next slide, please. Now, let's talk about improving the intestinal component. That's the important uh, you know, component in making the performance um, in birds really good. The reason is that the <clears throat> pathogens are always a problem for uh, poultry performance, you know, a hindrance to poultry performance, and also to the poultry health. That's what I mean. Um, one of the most important uh, organisms which are causing, you know, problems, consistent problems in poultry is Clostridium perfringens. And as you can see, that it results in, um, you know, it, it is reported that it results in a reduction of about 12 percentage of the body weights and about 10, uh, about 10 to 11 percentage of the increase in the feed conversion ratio without any obvious noticeable mortality in the flock. So that means this particular uh, organism, Clostridium perfringens, which is a spore-forming spore -forming gram-positive organism um, causing necrotic enteritis in brothers, they cause severe problem in terms of the production loss. Now, how can we deal with it? You can see that carvacol, cinnamaldehyde, limonene, pimol, geraniol, chamomile, and citronella, all these components are being tested against Clostridium perfringens, and they found there are at least three different uh, three different published reports indicating that the the or the essential oils have uh, showed inhibition of Clostridium perfringens um, uh, in the in 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 the birds inside the birds. It is not the uh, not the bench top experiment. It actually proved that the Clostridium uh, perfringens could be reduced in the flocks. Now. Apart from the bacterial population, we have viral infections that affects our flock, including the infectious bronchitis, uh, which is abbreviated IB, or Newcastle disease, abbreviated NCD, and Gamboro, which is uh, infectious bursal disease. And um, there, are, there are studies, at least two or three, which I've uh, reviewed, um, indicates that essential oils in combination with vaccination has resulted in improving the immune response uh, in the birds against IB and CD and Gumbolo. Could you please move ahead, please? Now let's talk about Imeria. Now coming, you know, so we have, we've been talking about uh, bacteria, which is Clostridium perfringens. We talked about viruses, which, is, which includes IB and CD, um, and then the infectious, you know, bursal disease. And we are now talking about the coccidia, Imeria, which is a protozoan, protozoal disease. I just want to make sure that the entire microbial world is covered in terms of some experiments that has been carried out in terms of research um, on essential oils against these organisms. And, and, and most of you know, possibly might be knowing, Imeria, or coccidiosis, is a, is a significant problem in poultry, especially in brawlers. And the presence of Imeria would result is actually a, a predisposing factor for the Clostridium perfringens infection. Now, what is the problem with Imeria that causes bleeding in the gut? Bloody diarrhea is one of the important signs of this disease. And you can see that there are four different um, you know, species of Imeria that causes infections in birds. Imeria cervelina, Imeria maxima, Imeria tinella, Imeria nicatrix, and Imeria brunetti. Those are the five major animal organisms that cause infections in chickens that causes a lot of problems. You know, I have dealt with this and this is a, this is a horrible pathogen to deal with. Once the flock is infected, the entire, um, the entire uh, you know, shed is infected and it is really hard to get rid of this pathogen out. Now, in order to control this, um, I took two, uh, two, two, two um, research reports and also a, 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 um, a review. Uh, you can see Michaelina and Danuta in 2017. I took that um, as, a, as a review article as well uh, to indicate that cinnamaldehyde and oregano were tested against Imeria sovelina and Imeria chinella. Now when cinnamaldehyde was supplemented through feed um, against Imeria sovelina, that which causes the upper um, intestinal um, problems, especially the diarrhea with the up, upper intestinal tract infections, infections. They found that the gross lesion scores in the intestinal mucosa was reduced, and it also caused reduction in the, you know, the oocytes shedding between five and nine days of post-infection. And what happens with the oregano? 
Another study, um, you know, that, that GNNS, you can see that um, as a first reference there. They found that when they fed oregano oil, they found that Imeria silvalina um, uh, infections, when they infected the birds with Imeria silvalina, that resulted in body weights and feed conversion ratio in comparison or comparable with the non-infected group by the carvacol. So these are indications, again, that these uh, essential oils could be beneficial, could be beneficial choices to control these pathogens in poultry. Now go to the next slide, please. Now the third important thing is in terms of improving the carcass quality. Now we know that consumers would like to go for non-synthetic um, molecules to make it more natural. Um, we know, know that to improve the carcass quality, we are using, uh, you know, <clears throat> butylated hydroxytoluene, otherwise ab abbreviated as BHT, and butylated hydroxy anisole as synthetic antioxidants in industrial processing. But one of the problems or concerns that we currently have is in terms of the carcinogenic potential of these, uh, these compounds by, as determined by the toxicologist. Now, in the meat industry, uh, they are currently promoting rosemary, organo, and sage. They are being investigated um, thoroughly as alternatives to BHT and BHA. Now, what's the big deal about these essential oils as antioxidants? Now, poultry has poorly unsaturated fatty acids. Compared to swine, compared to pork, about 60% of the total fat is poorly unsaturated fatty acids. That is what which causes the off flavors, off odors, and reduce the shelf life of uh, chicken meat. Now, what can be done to control this is instead of BHA and BHT, we can go with organo, thymol, carvacol, and you see capsaicin, carvacol, and cinnamaldehyde also there. And these are the alternatives that have been tested by the by researchers. Um, and the last sentence, you see that the ginger root. Uh, this is only one study. Let me tell you that it should be a, it, it should be taken it with caution. You know, there's, that's only one study. Ginger, ginger root that improved the superoxide dismutase enzyme, which indicates that it actually reduces the oxidative injury that caused inside the, inside the broilers, which is a very positive sign that, um, you know, other than the antioxidant effects they are having, you know, if efficacy against the superoxides and the hydroxyl radicals, which are being created as a part of the pro-oxidant pathways. Move on to the next slide, please. Now, coming on to the fourth and most important these days, everybody is behind microbiome, and everybody is interested to know what happens to the microbiome of chickens. There are several studies that are happening now, but when I looked into the literature survey, I found that there are variable observations in terms of how the essential oils are um, influencing the microbiota. Some of the studies indicated that they restore microbiota balance after challenge, uh, using path after challenge with pathogens. Um, there's another study, one study indicating that oregano exerted bactericidal effect on lactobacillus, but it's not good, which is not good. We need the bacteria, we need lactobacillus population in the gut. So oregano had some effect on um, lactobacillus. But we have found in our, when I was doing my research, doctoral research, one of my colleagues found out that uh, oregano, for that matter, carvacol, the compound that is coming from oregano, had no effects on at least 10 different species of lactobacillus. Um, so there are controversies, there are differences in the opinion in terms of researchers, in terms of what is happening in terms of their effects on the microbes. Um, and then again, one, another publication that uh, came out from our group, from a research group, indicated that there is no um, change in the clostridial population, lobnococcus, proteus, bacteroides, and, uh, and the, the so-called production-oriented bacterial genera. Uh, you know, these are the organisms that we want to see in the gut, not that being changed to, a, to, a, to, a, to an extreme level. So we found, um, one of my colleagues, Indu, she found in one of her research that um, when she did, I think she did microbiome analysis as well. She found that these organisms were not affected as a result of trans treatment, if I remember it right. Move to the next slide, please. Now, the fifth point is that their efficacy on foodborne pathogens. And I'm not going to expand on it because we have already discussed my research at the five, uh, you know, in five uh, slides where I showed the, uh, the, the efficacy of these compounds against foodborne pathogens. So in order to give you a brief idea generally, 
these uh, the, the or the, several of the essential oils have been proven to be effective against foodborne pathogens like gram positive organisms, gram negative organisms. Um, although there is an indication, and people say, and there are reports indicating that essential oils are good against gram positive organisms versus gram negative organisms. But I have what I found in my investigations is that they're equally um, good in, in, in activating both gram positives and gram negative organisms that are that are that infects poultry and which are of uh, much importance in humans. Now salmonella and Campylobacter uh, we have found our research team has found they respond really well to cinnamaldehyde eugenol, beta resorcelic acid, caprolic acid, thymol and carbacol. And there are studies indicating that essential oils are good against Clostridia, Staphylococcus, Bacillus. And another species which we did not talk about is fungi. Um, again, it is really promising that fungus, especially the aflatoxins, uh, are really a problem in feed, uh, you know, because they, they can, the moles can grow in the feed and then can, can contaminate the feed by causing, um, you know, by causing severe loss. And also in terms of the production of toxins in the feed and also toxins in the tract, um, in the tract of chickens. And the problem is that these toxins have got potential hepatotoxic effects, meaning they can affect the liver, um, causing the production performance to go down. And then when we did a trial in, in Connecticut in terms of determining the efficacy of transcendomaldehyde and carvacol against uh, two different uh, aflatoxin producing organisms, Aspergillus flavus, and Aspergillus parasiticus, that is published in Poultry Science. We found that these essential oils were able to reduce not only the number of fungal, fun, fungi, but at the same time, the aflatoxin B1, which is the predominant toxin uh, that is produced by the fungi. So, um, as I said, we, we already talked again, we talked about adeno, entero, and rotaviruses again. And rotaviruses, as you know, it causes significant problems um, and is a cause of, uh, and it's a, a severe problem to the uh, human public health as well. Can you move on to the next slide, please? We are almost towards the end. And I would like to just briefly um, talk to you about the essential oils effects on immune system. Now, there are several questions that I have faced before, you know, when I go and talk to Doc during seminars and uh, and and then and then uh, the presentations, they ask me if it is absorbed from the system, then how can these be effective uh, in chickens? That question is a great question. That I used to say this is a great question, but at the same time, we have to go and look into the research publications that have already come up in chickens. Yeah, there there are not many, just like what is happening in swine and in in humans. But there are few publications that are happening that are published in chickens, indicating that thyme has improved IgA levels. You know, immunoglobulin A, which is a secretory antibody. This is the antibody that you see fight against pathogens in the intestinal tract. So if they can produce IgA at the intestinal level as a secretory antibody, that indicates that they have an effect, not just what we observe, but they have mechanistic and molecular methods of action that causes these uh, immunoglobulins to be released uh, at the gut level. Please go ahead. Now let's talk about a bit about the metabolism and safety. Now, as I said, essential oils can be quickly absorbed from the intestines, even from the intestinal tract. If we are if you are giving them, uh, if, if you are giving the birds through the oral route, it can be absorbed really well through the pulmonary route, um, meaning the respiratory route. It can be also taken well through the dermal route. That's why, in a in only one single experiment, uh, if I remember right. Uh, when they applied, um, I don't remember the oil's name, they applied the oil, I don't know which oil was that, but they applied it on, uh, you know, layer skin and they found um, reductions in Dermanus's gallinate. And I have to check, you know, which oil was that. Um, so I'm not going to, you know, in depth about this, uh, you know, observation on dermal routes. But as far as I'm concerned, in the intestinal route, they are getting absorbed. Yes, at the intestinal, at different segments, they are getting absorbed and they're metabolized in the liver, and some of the components are being excreted, but that may have secreted into the lower parts of the intestines as well. You know, 
uh, you have to understand that, for example, we take transcinnamaldehyde. Transcinnamaldehyde is, is transformed into benzoic acid and cinnamic acid, if I remember right. Um, as, uh, definitely benzoic acid. And some of these benzoic acid is present at the end portion of the intestinal tract. So we do not know the mechanism uh, you know, at this point of time because we do not have bioavailability studies, have been con absorption studies have been conducted with these essential oils. But they are absorbed, but at the same time, they can be presented at different levels of the intestine and also in the blood. And one of the most important key features of essential oils is their rapid clearance um, from the system. It has got very short half-life. And then because, of the, you know, because they are absorbed in the proximal uh, you know, tract of the intestine, um, it is really unlikely that the bacteria, the beneficial bacteria that are there at the other parts of the intestine gain resistance against these molecules because if they are not presented as such, you know, the obvious change that they are exposed to these molecules at lower levels are very low. So, the, so from, the, from the safety perspective, I'm really positive, although I'm not talking it out uh, based on the research, which I should not be, but I'm just taking uh, a, a, a step ahead because I'm talking to the backyard flocks. You should understand that there are mechanisms, potential mechanisms of action by which they can be metabolized in a beneficial way for poultry as well. But given that, I would like to stress on certain things before I move to the, fi you know, move to the final two slides. Uh, we have, uh, you know, research, you know, we have research done in several, with several essential oils, but I would say that we need more research to strongly prove the mechanistic side of things. Um, you know, without that, as a researcher like me, would be always asking what is behind this activity. You know, I am convinced of its antimicrobial activity, and currently I'm doing microbiome analysis, uh, you know, uh, in chickens, which are exposed to, for that matter, turkeys and broilers exposed to different kinds of essential oils and see what is happening there. And we are looking into the immunoglobulin levels. And so there are answers that we can provide as a, as a, as a, as a continuum of research that is going on with the funded projects that we currently have. Move along, please. Now, I am not a regulatory person, but at the same time, one of the things that we have to be cautious about using the essential oils is that they are recognized as generally recognized as safe chemicals as a source of flavor or flavor enhancer in animal feed. So when we talk about that, the concentrations that are being applied as an essential oil in the feed uh, needs to be validated for its other uses that we have just talked about. Some of the uses need to be, uh, you know, further validated, and probably for that matter, um, we need to get an approval from the federal agencies uh, for those specific purposes. Can you go ahead, please? Now, what's next? And I am going to stop here. You know, this is taken up. Uh, to, this portion has been taken from one of the reviews that we wrote as a part of the book chapter. Myself and my advisor, Dr. Kumar, um, we found that the studies are there, but at the same time, we need more studies to tell the people that yes, these are, um, these are, these are working beyond doubt. We know that there are studies supporting. Um, as I said, I was discussing all those studies. We know that those studies are substantially talking to us indicating the potential of these um, uh, essential oils. But I would suggest what we came up up we, we came up was we have to target specific groups, as I said about terpenes, terpenoids, um, you know, and, and then the phenylpropenes. You have to classify them and study for their potential from the mechanistic angle to, realize, to realistically understand what is happening at the mechanistic level. Now, the fourth and the fifth point, improving the solubility, and improving the inhibiting the volatility, those are all things that we are currently working on, um, and we have tried our um, we have tried uh, different different types of uh, solubilizing agents and uh, you know inhibitors to volatile volat you know reducing the volatility of these compounds, and those are the regions which are those are the sections which we are currently doing as part of research, and. Um, um, Long-term toxicology studies need to be done in order to determine what happens at the metabolic level. And of, obviously, some economic considerations need to be done before they're used in, uh, in poultry. But as you know, the translation has already happened with industry taking this opportunity 
and making these essential oils integrated to their feed and their, uh, you know, their ingredient mix. So it's a very positive sign that, um, that the essential oils can find their niche, in, you know, under the, uh, you know, under uh, correct provisions of economic um, considerations. And that's it. And, and could you move to the next slide, please? And I think that's uh, where I would like to stop. And, uh, you know, if there are questions, could you please um, send it to me? And I'm glad to answer any other questions if you have them. We have a uh, specific question about um, products that they could use in, um, you know, in a backyard flock. Yes. Um, they, you know, a lot of the pr people use essential oils themselves. Yep. Um, how can they use it in a backyard flock? Okay. Very good question. So let me give you my, my, um, my experience with it. And also I would like to talk it from the industry, the product that we have currently in use. Um, when I, you know, the first experiment that I used to determine the efficacy of transcendent was direct addition of transcendent in water. And I did not use any, uh, you know, solubilizing agents or, you know, compounds that actually, uh, you know, reduced its um, um, volatility. But what I did was I added a higher concentration of cinnamaldehyde and added it in water. And we found that the essential oils went down um, and then settled down at the, at the bottom of the waters. And that's one of the problems that you might um, encounter when the essential oils are used per se in the water. But the efficacy would be there if you continually change on a daily basis. Um, you know, that, that's what I have found. And we found really incredible results in terms of reducing the pathogens uh, that we inoculated with. But that's not the final solution per se. Uh, we need to have certain compounds that are in place to solubilize them uh, to go well in the water. Now, from the industry perspective, there are products that are currently in market and, and as, an, as, an, as an academician and as a researcher, I'm not going to endorse any product, but I can obviously say some uh, direction, give you some directions as to what, uh, what is currently there in the market. Um, you know, Cargill has introduced a, a new product into the market, which is a mixture of seven essential compounds. If you just go to their website, um, you would find um, uh, the, the information about that. Um, that product, you know, I do not know if I can say the product's name. Um, I would leave that there. You can go and check into the um, link there. And I can provide you the link if you would like to send that as a link. And then there, there are two products, which are, there's one product that is, uh, that is already in market um, by DuPont. And uh, that is also there. I have the link to that nutrition, uh, to, the, to, to their product website. And there is another product that is in market, currently in market, uh, uh, manufactured by Jeffo Nutrition in Canada. And for that also, that's a combination of organic acids and uh, um, essential oils, you know, in combination. So if you want details, I can send the, send the links to Jackie and Jackie can proceed it to the people who are interested. So to bring it all together, if you add directly into water, I have seen effects against um, uh, uh, foodborne pathogens. But what happened was the feed consumption reduced when I increased the concentrations of direct addition of essential oils. So I would not recommend direct additions unless and otherwise um, it is, if you want to try, um, it, it might work. And number two, we, we have product in market, or several products in market that, uh, you know, for, for example, Cargill has uh, claimed that they have conducted already 12 trials, already 12 trials to determine the, uh, the uh, efficacy and they have found their body weights improved by 2% and feed conversion by 1.5%. So there are products in the market manufactured by this industry um, counterparts. There are some products that are certified organic as well, correct? Yes, exactly, so, yes. So they could be used in organic production sure. uh, in layers or for meat production, right? Sure, yes, yes that's correct. Okay. Um, and even for the stability of the, uh, you know, the, the products, you know, uh, you know the, the, the two new generation companies that they have brought up the idea of antioxidant uh, activity of essential oils as well. Okay. Are there any other questions? Just put them in the chat box or the Q&A box. 
Okay, there's somebody wants the link, so send me the links. I will send you the link. I will send you the link. And I will make sure that um, Michael gets it. Okay, so I will. I will just. I will send it to you right now, and then um, that's because. I say, if you want to put that in chat too, you know, you can put it in chat directly. No, the, the user can. No, I, 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 I will. I will forward that to Jackie because as a as I, I just would like to make sure that I'm sure. not. Um, yeah, okay. That's not a problem. Because you can put it right in the chat box. Um, Jack. I'm going to send it to you. Okay. It might take a few minutes for it to arrive yeah. here. Yeah. Meanwhile, you know, if they have any other questions, I can I can answer that as well. Yeah. If we wait, as soon as I get the uh, okay. the links, I will put them in the chat box. Okay. It's taken a few minutes to get here. So, um, Go ahead. so are you recommending that, you know, a backyard flock that's not having any health issues go to essential oils or is that something more for um, a big commercial operation that wants to go antibiotic free to think about? Um, that's a, that's a very good question. I just forward forward the information to you, Jackie. I'm still waiting for it. So, okay, uh, you should be able to get it. There are three products there, and you okay. can yeah you can use it according to what. Okay, now to answer that question, these um these essential the, these companies big companies have um introduced this into market, targeting larger production scenarios, obviously. But at the same time, uh, what as, as, a, as, a, as a person who teaches the backyard chickens class um, to more than 100 students every semester, I keep them, I, I consider backyard chickens as an emerging area where we need to put in our interest and see if they are going to be beneficial for them. Um, so if there is a product that you would like to test from the, from the, from the industry um, as an industry product that is available as an industry product, I would, I would recommend, um, I would recommend um, using them. But again, when I say that claim, do not take that as a comment from a researcher from University of Minnesota. Um, I'm, I'm technically saying that because these products um, have potential to improve the production performance um, with reasonable uh, research background that we just discussed. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that the industry products that are in the current market could be in flocks as well, although I have not myself conducted any research on those products. Okay, I put the link to the DuPont fact sheet uh, in the it mostly deals with um, research products. So the, the uh, essential oil product is in vivo, right? Yeah, in vivo. In vivo EO. Oh, I'm sorry. I should not have said it. Sorry. Oh, it's not a problem. We're not, um, we're not endorsing a particular product. product. Yes. We are simply providing an example yes. of a product that is on the market that um, they could consider using yes. in their backyard flock. Yep. And then the DuPont, did you see the Cargill product, by the way? Um, I did, all I saw was the, the... No, there's another one, Intella. You see that? Yeah, there's no link to it. Oh, though. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. That can be easily found. It can be. Okay. Um, th so the other product was Intella. Oops. Tella fit from Cargill. Okay, there's a question. Okay. How, how much will be the effective concentration of essential oils in broilers to control pathogens without affecting its production parameters? Okay, very good question. Now, <clears throat> there are two components to that question. One is that we have gone up to, from our research, I can talk from my research perspective, we have gone up to 0.75 percentage in broilers. That was direct addition into the feed, but that was daily addition into the feed. 
and we have gone up to one percentage in layers um, without any reduction in the feed consumption or for that matter any production parameters that we tested and in layers we did not see any difference in terms of the quality of the eggs from the organoleptic perspective we tested it and we did not find any difference in terms of the eggs that came out of the layers that were fed with one percentage of uh, transcendamaldehyde so that is the concentration that we tested against pathogens. Now, there are studies that indicate a lower concentration of, 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 of products could also result in pathogen reduction. But what I am concerned about the low concentration is that because these compounds are volatile in nature, two things can occur. One, the moment you add it in the feed, Technically, they will be volatile because they are volatile. They, they'll be vaporized or, you know, they will be gone. Number two, there is a potential chance that these molecules, when, it, when, go, when they go inside the tract, can absorb, can get absorbed at the intestinal tract and may not have a direct effect on the pathogens when we use them at lower concentrations. So from the research, it is about 0.5 to 0.75 percent in broilers and 1%, up to 1% in layers. But those were research combinations. We did them on a daily basis. Um, but most of the industry, commercial preparations, um, we tested, um, we are actually in the, in the process of testing one of those compounds. Um, most of the compounds, they are used at 0 0.0 levels, 0 0.05 or 0 0.06 levels at the industry combinations. And I may not be exactly right when I say 0 0.05. It is at a decimal um, level lower than what we used because they are using solubilizing agents um, to solubilize and to make them um, go well in the feed during the processing techniques. So they use their proprietary blend um, to make sure that they go well in the feed. So in the feed, the concentration of essential oils might be really low um, than what we use for the research purposes. Okay. Are there any more questions? I am looking for the... Um, this is um, Cargill's website with their feed additives. So you should be able to... Um, find the different things that they use for poultry uh, on there. And it has the Intella yes. there, so. And I forward that link to you as well. I just got it. Okay. Organic versions. There are organic versions. Yes, there are. I know that um, Omri, which certifies um, organic materials for inclusion in poultry diets has several essential oil products that are approved for use in organic feeds. Mm -hmm. um, if you're growing organically, certified organic, always make sure with your certifier that they accept the product as well. But uh, Omri has a, a few listed that they, um, that they do. And, and Jackie, I can send you one more link, uh, which is organic essential oils. Mm -hmm. I can send you a link there. Okay. Uh, did you get it? So they the one you the one you sent me on Cargill was the one I had put yes. up. So and right after that, right after that, I send you another link. Okay, I haven't got it yet. And those are uh, organic essential oils. Okay. And I'm hoping that they have the product listed there. So the uh, company's called Organic Essential Oils. They they are currently in the essential oil market. But that's the name of the company, Organic Essential Oils? No, no, Kalsec, K-A-L-S-E-C. -E oh, okay, this guy here. Okay, yeah. I gotcha. So that's the link to Organic Essential Oils for the person who asked that question. Any other questions? Well, our time is, is up. Thank you very much, Anoop, for um, giving My the pleasure. presentation. My pleasure.
and uh, again, I remind you that if you go to the um, the small and backyard flocks uh, community of practice homepage, you can see our upcoming webinars. Um, as I said, December's one is on ventilation and insulation for backyard poultry housing. And then we, in January, we are doing poultry integrated pest management for flies, birds, and rodents in backyards. And then in March, I still working on February, uh, March is environmental enrichment for small and backyard flocks. So I hope that you'll come back to us. Um, as we said at the beginning, this is being recorded and it should be up uh, by Monday at the latest, right, Mark? Yep. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, folks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank